Hello, I'm Toy Cat, and welcome back to another Geopolitics video. Today we're going to talk about Asia, which is of course the largest continent on Earth, a fact I'm sure you're all aware of, but you might not be aware of the fact that it actually contains 60% of the world population. That's right, this one continental landmass contains 6 in every 10 human beings alive today. They're all in this one place right here, and because of that fact, I feel like it's a great uh, place to talk about one of the more controversial uh, you know, ideas and opinions I think should be shared from time to time, because personally, I don't think democracy is an innately defendable idea. I think democracy is great, I think it's the least worst system that has been tried, to quote Winston Churchill, uh, but the truth is, uh, you know, democracy does have some flaws sometimes, and it's really important to notice what they are, so you can correct for them in your country, because if you live in a Western European, or you live in North America, things are usually pretty fine in your country, you know, elections work and things are just about okay, but the truth is, Asia has a lot of democracies, it has a lot of non-democracies too, uh, such as absolute monarchy in Saudi Arabia, uh, such as, uh, you know, communist one-party state in Vietnam, or such as North Korea, you know, supreme leader and all that, um, but there are a lot of democracies in Asia, but they all have very different parameters to what you'd expect in the West if you've never followed an Asian election. I figured why not go through some rather interesting points, not as like this huge criticism because I'm crusading against democracy, just so that we can understand the other side and how things can kind of be like, huh, that's that's not how you'd expect. That's what I'm going for in today's video, hopefully you'll enjoy it. I know some people would just be like, wait, democracy is the one thing I live for, and truth be told, when I was younger, it was, you know, like, uh, democracy, 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 anything can be solved with that, but the truth is, not anything can be solved with that, just a lot of things. So with that said, let's dive straight into it. We're going to go from west to east, we're going to have different amounts to say about each country, because we can start, for instance, you know, after we go from the Middle East, which is the no-go zone, uh, funnily enough, Iran's like the least no-go zone country in the Middle East, right? Like, you know, Middle East, still a touchy region, Iran, still a touchy subject, but I feel like I can mention this just off the cuff and say, just as a fun fact, uh, because, you know, Iran does have a democracy, it's fairly stable, they had a lot of issues uh, previously, and it looks like they're going to a better place right now. The, the you know, the position they call their leader, because, you know, there's a lot of prime ministers in countries, uh, especially with Westminster systems, there's a lot of presidents, and in Iran, they call their leader the supreme leader of Iran. That's right, and I looked up the title, just to make sure this isn't like a, a common thing in the Arabic world and I'm just being really culturally insensitive. No, you look up the list of leaders that have called themselves supreme leader at one point and it's like, oh, Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, the North Korea guy, and oh yeah, what a what a wonderful list of uh, companions they have there. So just fun fact, Iran has a elected leader that's called the Supreme Leader, so you might hear about him and think, wow, that guy is just, you know, he's a, he's a real hitter of Stalin, but he's actually elected, and even though you can have your issues with that, I just thought that was a wild thing. But anyway, let's talk about our first real example, our biggest example of democracy in the world, because India actually has the world's largest democracy. The lo the, when they had their election in uh, 2014, it was the world's largest democratic event that had ever occurred. The uh, you know Most people voting for one singular thing. When they have their next election in 2019, there'll be close to 100 million more voters than in their last election. This, the scale and the size of the increase in voters from each of these elections to the next one is really almost incomprehensible. And when you look at this map right here, it really seems oversimplified, right? Like that is a uh, eligible voter population of 800 million, about half a billion votes, uh, you know, because not everyone votes, half a billion votes, it looks like that, and it's like, oh, so they elected their, you know, Gayan Shah, who's called a Prime Minister here, by the way, uh, again, there's a split usually based on the system, but he, he's got a Prime Minister in India, and it's like, yeah, it looks like he won most of the country, but like most electoral maps, there's kind of like a misleadingness to it. So, again, I'm not saying, like, I'm innately against first past the post, although I vaguely am, and I'm not saying that, like, oh yeah, you need to be elected by everyone in your country to be legitimate, but bear in mind, the guy uh, in charge, he's, his party, is called BJP, and his party got about 30% of the votes, and because he got 30% of the votes, he's currently Prime Minister, oh, or his Electoral Alliance, because a lot of countries have those, including India, got 37% of the vote. So, around about a third of Indian people voted for him or his alliance, and now he gets to rule the country. But that means that his 130 million voters, the fact that, you know, 130 million people picked him, means he gets to rule over a country of 1.3 billion. And when you think about it, there's something a bit rough about that, because in most systems where there is, you know, like a balance of power you have to go over, once you get 51% of the power, or, you know, sometimes it's 67, but once you get that percentage of the power, you then have all of the power in the country, and as a result, India is controlled by someone who has 130 million people who did vote for him, but all of those other people that didn't. And again, I think it's fine, I think he's legitimate, I'm not making big, uh, you know, points about the Indian election. I will say, uh, there was a lot of scandals about like, oh, there was bribery in the government, but one of the big election issues was actually stir of onions. Uh, but I will mention, just very briefly, that that is a problem all democracies have to address, and having a, you know, having a system like that, a country so big, you need to work out an alternative electoral system, because think about it, one of the big issues that people have with uh, dictatorships or with 
communist countries is that you don't get to pick your leader. The leader is either picked for you or you have to go out and vote for the one choice you have. That's that's why Nazi Germany was so bad. That's why, you know, Stalin's uh, Russia was so bad um, or East Germany and all, all these different examples. They're bad because you don't really get to pick. But if you get to pick and then most people don't have their guy in charge, is that better? You know, like uh, it's, it's one of those big questions you have to at least think about. Again, uh, this isn't, I, I don't want anyone here to be like, oh, you're, you're saying he's not a legitimate leader. No, funnily enough, there actually isn't an opposition in Nidia right now because their, uh, their, you know, their system requires you to have at least 10% of votes to be the official opposition. No other single party got 10%, you know, to his 30%. So he's clearly the guy in charge. The BJP is clearly the biggest party. Uh, there's no official opposition even, which means he has even more power. It's a weird situation. And I just think it's one worth following because India is the world's largest moxie. And I really want to put in scale that like, like, you know, if they're going to have, you know, close to a billion voters at some point, that's bigger than if there was one single government for all of the EU, in fact, all of Europe, let's say, as well as uh, all of North America. If they all combined forces, they'd have less voters in their election, you know, the NATO leader or whatever you want to call it, uh, than India has for theirs. So pretty wild, just a little fun fact I mentioned, because it is the world's largest moxie. I felt like we couldn't ignore it. And uh, yeah, let's talk about a country that definitely isn't the world's largest moxie, but is a rather interesting example regardless, because it's Nepal. So if you don't know, Nepal is one of the two countries between India and uh, China. India and China have some interesting relations as you can see by their border right here, but it's not it's not a border video today, it's an election video. So let's talk about the Nepal elections because out of all of the democracies in the world right now, I think Nepal is a really interesting example because, um, so there's a lot of communist countries that exist in the world. Uh, you can look most of them up, but they're mostly one party states or they're states that kind of rig the election system in their favor. I think no, no one can argue Venezuela isn't that, right? Like, oh, I mean, we'll just create a new assembly that has all the powers and then <laughs> look into Venezuela sometime if you're curious about that. But basically, uh, you know, Nepal is, one, is the only country of all of the democracies in the world, the hundred plus countries that democratically pick their leader, democratically pick their parties. Um, Nepal Nepal is the only country that has ever voted for a communist party to be in charge. So, uh, yeah, most, like I said, most communist parties, uh, countries are one party states because if you gave people the choice, they would usually pick no. Usually you have to have a revolution to get it in place and then people assume it will be popular sometime later and it never generally is. Again, this this seems like it's some radical like oh anti-communist propaganda. That's just you know how the electoral uh, system seems to work. However, I love that Nepal actually did vote for a communist party because then it raises the big questions of like what happens if you do that? Like what happens if you vote for a party that effectively wants to overturn everything? And the interesting thing is that for the you know for Nepal to become a communist country, like the majority, not the super majority, but the majority of voters do want, uh, they actually need to get a super majority to overturn the constitution. They need to reverse a lot of free markets. So right now they're just a very communist leaning country. They do a lot of what they can and they're trying to gain powers of like, maybe we should have, you know, our party should have power of the military. There's a lot of weird things going on in relation to that. But I think it's interesting, like if the people vote for something that should require a 66% majority and then the thing, you know, like they voted for a party that said they would do something that they needed a 66% majority for, but they got a 51% majority, should they have the power to just do it anyway? And obviously I think the answer is no, but it raises this big electoral question of like, the majority of people want something, but not a super majority, what do you do there? They just do their current like vaguely compromised solution? Is that a good thing? I think there's benefits, there's also downsides, but it's an interesting situation with the Nepal election. So again, Nepal, by the way, most famous for uh, Everest. If, you, if you're wondering like, I think I've heard of that from somewhere. I wanna do a whole video on the border sometime. I wanna do a whole video on Everest sometime. Like it's just one of those hugely fascinating subjects that uh, again, would love to bring up. But for now, uh, let's just mention Nepal, uh, country, the only country in the whole world right now on a country-wide level to have a communist party in charge. There is a communist party of Great Britain. There is a communist party of the United States. They actually were funded by uh, Russia back during the 90s, like openly, I believe. Oh, sorry, the prior to the 90s, I should mention. They're just not very popular because uh, most people, when given the choice, don't pick communism, which if you are a communist, then that tells you, you need to rebrand. You need to be something that's popular. I don't like when people are like, well, people don't want communism, so we should force it on them. Because it's like, I mean, you use that argument in anything else in life, and it's kind of dodgy, right? Like, oh, this girl doesn't doesn't want me, but she will after I'm done. No, 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 that's not okay. So with that said, let's talk about Bhutan, because speaking of not wanting a thing, what if your country doesn't want democracy, right? Um, this might seem like, what do you mean, a country doesn't want democracy? How, how does that work out? Well, uh, Bhutan, as I've briefly mentioned before, it comes up in every economics class, so if you've ever taken economics, you know what I'm about to say. Uh, but basically, they had a, uh, they had a king, 
And the king was a wildly popular figure, so popular in fact, that when democracy uh, was suggested by him, the people did not like it. The people uh, decided <laughs> they did not want the thing, but he he, he pushed through regardless. And uh, you know, so democracy ca came to Bhutan last month on the insistence of its much-loved fourth king, Jimei uh, Singye Wangchuk, who decided people should choose their leaders whether they wanted to or not. This is Brutus, by the way, in case you think this is some weird, uh, funny uh, stance. But funnily enough, when they introduced democracy, they had to do a trial democracy because the people were just so weirdly against the concept and when people do uh you know hold these elections the way they do it is like uh you know so this is a genuine election pitch please do not choose me i am just a humble man is a sort of campaign refrain which went down well in rural Bhutan. in fact uh the the party which won uh, the first election uh they said all they tried to do is they just tried to educate voters which i know is what most parties would try to say but i genuinely believe it when it comes to bhutan maybe you know naively but yeah they did not want democracy they got democracy against their will and the fun economics thing I mentioned earlier is the fact that they don't measure the success of their country by GDP. The amount of value produced is not how they measure their their value. They measure it by happiness. So they didn't not, they didn't have TV until 1999, where they aired Desperate Housewives as their first ever program. Top top notch choice, by the way. Uh, I don't believe they have McDonald's yet. They're one of the very few countries uh, that did not have a McDonald's, at least as I did the research for this video. And um, yeah, basically a wild country uh, with a lot of interesting things to say. Like, they're one of the very few countries that didn't want democracy and got it anyway. Is it going to be good for them in the long run? I guess we'll have to wait and see. But I, I like it as an example. I think it's interesting that not every country does want democracy. Just most of them. And maybe this goes against what I just said. Like, oh, maybe clearly if you just take away democracy, then people will like it. But um, yeah, it, it shows that like you can have a system that, you know, you can have a non-democratic system that people like. You can have a system that people don't pick that the people do like. It's just very, very, very rare given history. But I think it's worth mentioning, like, there are exceptions. Not every election, will, you know, not every uh, democracy will turn away from communism. There is the one example in the world right now, as well as a few states and other countries. Uh, not every country wants to be a democracy. A lot of countries love their absolute dictatorships as well. Oh, sorry, absolute monarchies as well. Um, and speaking of countries uh, that love their absolute monarchies, um, Thailand does not have an absolute monarchy, but they do have a monarchy, and they also kind of have a military dictatorship. So uh, I feel like dictatorship is a little bit of a strong word, but again, you can... You can have your own opinions on this one. But right now, Thailand, uh, so in 2014, Thailand had an election. And then a little bit after the election, the uh, electoral police said, nah, it was not completed fast enough. It doesn't count. And then there was a coup by the military. And you might think, whoa, coup by the military. That, that must be affecting Thailand pretty seriously. But it was actually their 22nd coup. And again, you might say, ah, that's... That's not an accurate number, Toy Cat. It's actually 17 coups. So again, you can measure the coups differently. Uh, coup d'etat, where the military takes over the country, in case you don't know what coup means, because it sounds like I'm just making a bird noise. But uh, yeah, there was, there's been between, you know, depending on how you want to measure it, like maybe only 15 coups. O only 15 coups. Like, who doesn't have a wild weekend and then wake up with a coup in the morning? Um, but no, it, so they've had, they have a lot of coups in Thailand. And as a result, actually, it's a very safe country for, you know, foreigners to be in, which is a really surprising, like, wait, that's the opposite of how that works? No, as it turns out, they, they really like tourists, it's a big part of their revenue, and I just want to mention that as, like, a fun little fact right here, that, like, yeah, as a non-Thailand person, again, there are lots of downsides, many, many downsides if you do live in Thailand, but as a non-Thai person, as someone who does not live in, uh, by the way, Siam is its former name, uh, if you want to visit Bangkok, like, I, I, I actually had to convince a few friends, like, one was like, wait, is... No, is that a good thing? And I was like, don't worry, it's safe there. Got the military dictatorship in charge, and they, they, they love making stuff happen. So pro tip, if you want to visit uh, Thailand, then uh, the fact that they're not democracy actually just about works out in your favor. Also, it means you can bribe police. And you know, all of these things sound terrible on any objective level, but for some reason, pretty much everyone agrees that in Thailand, it's like, it's better if, you know, I, I don't understand. It's just... This seems to be the consensus amongst everyone you speak to. And uh, yeah, by the way, there are elections planned in Thailand. The military dictatorship is temporary. It's just this is the longest time where they've kind of been like, eh, we'll get, we'll get back around to democracy eventually. Uh, yeah, 2019 is when they'll go back to having more elections. They do have them. They just also like their king and, you know, because the, the king's got its whole own controversy. Fun fact, whatever. Uh, so yeah, with I said, uh, that's, that's sometimes what happens if you separate your military, your monarchy, and your, your government, you get a weird, weird triangle of confusion. And Thailand, just, you know, if you're going to have a democracy, you've got to either <laughs> trust your people or you've got to keep the military away from them. One, one of the two, I guess. So with that said, let's talk about Singapore next. Singapore is one of my favorite countries in the world. 
I feel like people, I don't know like what people are going to say, like, oh, you're just saying you like Singapore to try and get the, it's only like 5 million people that live there. But no, Singapore is one of my favorite countries uh, in the whole world, in Southeast Asia, if you want me to be more specific. Uh, if you've never been, you've never heard of it, look it up or go, whichever is easier. It's almost always easy to look it up. But no, let me talk about why I love Singapore and then why I felt very conflicted about it. Because Singapore is one of the most, okay, it's one of the safest countries, one of the richest countries, one of the... Name any good thing, you know, in a superlative, like most beautiful, most, uh, you know, busy, most dense. It will get pretty much all of them done. Uh, but the interesting thing about Singapore is that it is a democracy. It's a democracy that was founded, um, you know, by accident, really. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous video, I won't go too far into it, but Malaysia actually kicked them out. Singapore is the one country in the world that has been kicked out of, a, you know, like, <laughs> of all the other countries that, like, went independent over their own volition. Malaysia kicked out Singapore one day and they're like, Guess we're a sovereign nation now. Let's do this. And the guy in charge, um, I'm not going to try and say his name, but I'll put, I'll put it on screen, is actually a guy who was educated at Cambridge in the UK. He was incredibly smart, and he led the country in an amazingly well way. He, uh, for, for the years he was alive, he led a, de again, democratically elected government, um, which transformed Singapore from being just another Southeast Asian country to being all the things I said before. The richest, the one of the best life expectancies, one of the wealth, you know, wealthiest and richest, the same thing. But uh, all of these different things together, he made Singapore that. He made Singapore one of the most international facing countries in the world. However, all of those things are good, but Singapore has a really weird democracy situation. So every single election since the country's founding, 100% of the elections in Singapore as an independent nation's history have gone to the same party, uh, the PAP, if I'm not mistaken, and that is not normal. A any any other democracy in the world you look at, uh, it's again there there are very notable exceptions, but any other democracy you look at in the world, it goes back and forth. Largest democracy goes back and forth. UK, you know, goes back and forth. They even switch which two parties back and forth. Look at the US, pretty much every eight years goes back and forth. Um, Canada as well. And pick any country, there is a back and forth. But since, uh, you know, the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, when they had their first election, Singapore has been consistently under the PAP. That is concerning, you know? Um, and although uh, it's worth noting that if you look at electoral maps, it's like, oh yeah, well, it looks like in this year, the, uh, the, the opposition won one, one area. That's, that's really good. Uh, so yeah, is that concerning? Is that sign that maybe they're doing like a, a whatever you want to call it, a Putin, a, a North Korea thing, a East, a, 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 yeah, East Germany? No, the truth is Singapore was trans... Okay, so I've spoken for a lot of Singaporean people because I didn't believe they really liked the PAP. I thought it was one of these deals where like, uh, because Singapore has a lot of really harsh punishments, stuff like uh, they don't let you eat gum because at one point people ate gum and put it on the sensor of the metro. Metro got delayed. Gum is banned. It's, it's known as Disneyland's the death penalty. It's wonderful, but they had incredibly strict rules and everything. So because of that, I assumed like, so give me the scoop. I won't tell anyone. But do you really like the PAP? And again, I'm, we're talking an 18 year old dude. Like young people in every country are the most, are the people most bound to say, burn down the system, rebuild it again. So, you know, that, it's just a thing you like when you don't have capital and you don't have an investment in the system, you want to burn it down and start again. In Singapore, my, again, he was, I believe he was 18, maybe 19. He was old enough to drink and go to casinos. So you tell me what age that makes him in Singapore. But um, <laughs> he, he was like, yeah, I really like the PAP. And I asked another Singapore guy, I like the PAP. I'll probably vote for them too. And I was like, what's the deal with that? And he's just like, they do incredibly well. The Singapore, uh, Singapore as a country has every single year done extraordinarily well and people think it's either well managed or at the very least good enough managed you know it's a country where everyone is doing better year on year on year on year and it raises the question of like you know what? people only have this back and forth change because they don't feel like their country's doing that well enough if your country's doing in some cases arguably the best in the world do you want to you know roll the dice on that and go with the workers party you know the communist party which might lose a lot of the benefits singapore has and in the case of singapore the people pick no to this day the majority not even just like a, oh they get 47 percent no they get huge uh, majorities in terms of percent in the elections and uh, that's a thing that happens in singapore and the reason it happens uh, is because there is a little bit of uh, control by the government in the election system there's a very short campaign system, which I like as a rule, but it, it makes it harder for the, the secondary parties to get their, you know, to get the, the word out about them. It really just comes down to like, you've got seven days, you're going to pick the people you know, all these people who are going to start trying to sell you as much as they can in those seven days. And every single time, this, they pick the Singapore. It, since the, it will probably keep going on until something bad happens in Singapore. And it seems dodgy. 
Uh, again, because if you look at the same situation, like Russia, they make the uh, you know the elections favorable to Russians. They they elect a guy who seems like he's really good to Russians, even though you know when you look at objective figures, it doesn't seem so true. And to the world, Putin is not seen as a good leader, right? He's seen as a you know like a Russian nationalist, leader, whatever you want to call him. But uh, the difference between a Russia in that case and a Singapore is even though you might argue Singapore has even more restrictive election practices to favor their leading party. I mean, they don't shoot their opposition, but you know, they, they have at least a longer campaign period in Russia. But the difference there, the reason why you might argue Singapore is better is because at least Singapore is good to their people and good to the world. Is the election system, is the system by which you choose your government important? Is the system by which a government is made important? if they're good to the people. The truth is, like the Winston Churchill quote, where like, democracy is the worst system, except all the others that have been tried, the truth is, democracy is just a good way to make sure you care about all the people. You have to, to get their votes. The system makes you care. If you are a benevolent dictator, again, like, you know, in, in Bhutan, if you are a benevolent elected man, because, uh, you know, now, they're on like their third generation, but if you're an elected person, but admittedly like an elected person does a little bit of bending the rules, but, uh, it's not even bending the rules, just, you know, like, uh, restrictive elective practices. Does that make it okay? And it's a big ethical question. I, I still don't know. I, th I, I vaguely rule on the side of, like, sure, it grants stability, which allows us all to be richer. Um, and eventually, sometime it might go downhill, at which point I would be against it. And that's why you need to have checks and balances and good democracies, because eventually it might not go that way. But while it is going that way, you know, again, the benevolent dictator is a real thing. And it raises the big questions of, like, is it worth the trade-off? If we lose some amount of economic growth and prosperity and happiness just to prevent some, it's like an insurance policy. Democracy is a really solid insurance policy and, uh, you know, Singapore doesn't have it. Oh, Singapore does have it, but in a slightly dodgier way. Is that okay? You tell me. Uh, comments down below. That's that's what this video is about, the, the interesting situations of stuff like that. The interesting situations of countries like Taiwan, so Taiwan is officially a part of China, as if you ask China at least, as, as you can see. It's, it's just China. I don't know why it's labeled differently on my map, uh, but no, Taiwan is a is known as the Republic of China. Big split between the two Chinas. Basically, this uh, even though we call it Taiwan and China, China calls it China and China, and Taiwan officially calls it China and China. They claim they own that. They claim they own that. It's one country to both of them. They just disagree over who owns the whole country. And they've, they've gone to a situation where they vaguely acknowledge each other's existence. So Taiwan is the wildly successful capitalist one. They do better than China or ha did do better. Uh, I think nowadays it's the other way around. Um, and they did that in part because of their wildly successful industrial trading, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the interesting thing, I'd love to talk about Taiwan some whole time, but got to keep the video on the download, just focus on their democracy. So the thing about uh, Taiwanese, uh, you know, if you look at the people in charge of Taiwan, is since the country was, or since the island officially turned into the ROC, the official China, because uh, again, the, the, they fleed the mainland to Taiwan. Uh, so as soon as it became ROC, uh, it was ruled by the leading KMT, the Chinese nationalists, but ROC, Chinese nationalists, uh, just, let's just call it the not China <laughs> Chinese nationalists. So the not Chinese Chinese nationalists, the not China Chinese nationalists ruled the country from like, you know, when it was founded all the way up until the 1990s. Bec and you know, I thought like, oh, wow, they must have won so many elections because I was going back through and checking their elections out. And it's like, it's not that they won so many elections. It's just that they, you know, they didn't have elections. It was like a, again, vaguely military dictatorship. And then they started having elections. And interestingly enough, the party in charge when they started elections won the first election. And not only that, but they won more elections. They won two more elections in a row um, a little while after that. And uh, I think that's interesting that like, Despite being, again, being in that position where they were forcibly in charge, people still figured like, eh, yeah, we'll, we'll give them a try. And then they vote for the opposition, then they figured, eh, we'll go back to this. And uh, that's pretty wild, but speaking of wild, Hong Kong, another interesting example. Again, we're going to try and speed through this one. But Hong Kong is a part of China that if you look on any regular map, look on your Google Maps right now, unless you live in China, there's going to be a border between Hong Kong and China, because there is a border between Hong Kong and China. However, as I'd love to mention in some other video, as you can see, there's actually no border between Hong Kong and China, if you check the real uh, Google Maps. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about Hong Kong, because Hong Kong, unlike the rest of China, is democratic. Um, there are elections. However, uh, there's like two electoral alliances, like the India system, between like pro-China and pro Western slash UK slash international, whatever you want to call it. And uh, the pro Chinese uh, people actually vaguely win there, which is interesting. Doesn't seem like it's fake. And then there's a gov, uh, I think it's called the, no, it's called the chief executive, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there is a guy in charge who manages the coalition, but is like a neutral party. Imagine having a king 
that was no, a prime minister that was non-partisan. Very weird system. I in, encourage you to look into it sometime as like, a, oh, oh, what's that all about then? Uh, so yeah, Hong Kong. Uh, they also got, unlike the you know UK, which they were obviously a part of for a very long time, they have a proper proportional representation system. Just saying, what works out for Hong Kong, except when it doesn't actually. So anyway, let's talk about China, because China is not a democracy, right? And that's true. Uh, the highest level elections in China, the public don't get to vote on. If you live in China, you don't get to decide who who is, uh, you know, like Xi Jinping. <laughs> I can't pronounce his name, but um, you don't get to decide him. You didn't vote for him. He just he's just there eternally until he dies. So what's the deal with that? Ooh, you know, like, and the deal is that a communist country. However, despite being a communist country, China is. The the communist country I think I admire the most in the world. I I don't admire most communist countries because they mostly do it as a way to gain power for themselves. That's you know a well known thing about communism, right? Like, even though it's a noble objective, you can use a noble objective to do bad things. And a lot of people have used the noble objective to do bad things. Therefore, you know it's it's very hard to get on board with like, oh yeah, Laos is so great. However, China, despite being a communist country. They at least try out the other systems. So they have capitalist zones like Shenzhen. Uh, and obviously that's kind of by force because Hong Kong's there. But Shenzhen's wildly successful because it's basically a capitalist part of the country. And they also have elections. However, the elections thing isn't quite as good as this. So it's worth mentioning small villages, small rural areas do have their own elections. However, uh, it's kind of used as a way to stop Chinese people wanting democracy. And the way this works is because small villages, like I said, rural areas in China can vote for the people who lead that village. However, key catch there is the fact that uh, the Chinese authorities, again, this is suspected at least, they, at the very least, uh, they, uh, the, the Chinese media spends a lot of time reporting on bribery and other problems so that they can, you know, that <laughs> report in their media and say, wow, democracy is so bad, people just buy all the votes. And then you're like, wow, yeah, democracy sucks. Love the Chinese party in charge. And again, it works for them, so the country doesn't have revolutions. It's interesting, it's, it's a thing. And uh, yeah, just an interesting little example, that China has elections on purpose rather than denying people the elections that you might want people will think themselves like i'd love it if i could pick the guy in charge they did really give some people the choice and then say look how bad that works it's a lot easier to unite people under the goal of like we want something that doesn't exist right now that everyone should have uh getting people to rally behind but not democracy would be really easy but when you have democracy in place and it doesn't work it's like well look at that and uh, it's just an interesting example of like, wow, yeah, that's that's well played. That's that's geopolitics. That's uh, the rules of being a leader 101 right there. So one more example, though, before we go here, because Japan is another interesting example of a country that votes for. OK, so let me let me show you the elections of Japan since World War Two, because they had an emperor before that. And that's that's a whole other thing. They have an emperor today still, but he's not the guy in charge. So uh, after World War Two, Japan has some elections. And uh, they vote for the predecessors to the Liberal Democratic Party. Then a few years later, the Liberal Democratic Party forms, and they vote for the Liberal Democratic Party again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And they vote for the Liberal Democratic Party again, and again. And the, the, it, the country does quite well. You know, they're a manufacturing giant right now. And then, interestingly enough to me, this is the craziest thing, is because uh, I thought that was suspicious again. Like, a Singapore situation, like, oh... So they're voting for them because it works and because there's some weird rules going on here. No, actually, so Japan has some serious economic problems, in, uh, especially in the, uh, in the 80s. Uh, the, the 90s is known as the lost decade, in fact, because the 90s, there was pretty much no real growth and success for country. Like, the, basically, demographics are killing Japan and Japan is going from being one of the most populated countries to it's, it's, it's going down the list very close. A lot of problems with Japan, we can talk about them some other time. But because of a result of these problems, Followed by the uh, the huge recession crisis uh, that happened in Japan, I find it interesting that Japan had a general election in 2009 where they voted for a different party. They went from voting for the center-right Liberal Democratic Party to voting for the centrist Democratic Party. The Japanese people made a big change right there, and uh, you know they voted for again the, the Democrats as opposed to the Liberal Democrats, uh, if you want to say it that way. And I. Again, it's, it's it's such a cute tiny change where they're like, we're gonna vote for the opposition, these people are not doing the job, and then you know what happened three years later? <laughs> Jinzo A, Liberal Democrats, they're back, and they've been back ever since. They had election 2014, they won that, election 2017, won it too, and have won majorities ever since. The Democrats have long gone away, they're not one of the major parties anymore, and I'm just saying, isn't that crazy? Japan had an election where they lost, and they're like, we're gonna try out the opposition, and usually that's where the opposition shines, and they do their best, but they immediately, you know, crumbled away 
and then they voted for the the devil they knew again. And I I wonder if that's better. I I think I'd almost be happier for them if they never had because also I I blended the ocean around me. But <laughs> it's almost like happier for them if they've never done it because it's like one day you can vote for this too. But in this case, uh, it doesn't seem that way. But yeah, Japan, uh, their elections, they vote for the same party every time. Is that, is it okay to have an election? Like, if you have a democracy where you just vote for the same party every time, is it really a democracy? And the answer is, I guess, yeah. Like, you can always vote them out eventually. They always have that incentive against you. And I would argue, even based on Japan and uh, Singapore, some of the Asian tigers uh, even, I would say that having a single party be in charge for longer is better for the country. Obviously, as soon as that party starts messing with you, you have to vote them out. It's, it's an important part of the game. But there's the interesting kind of, it's like two opposite things going together. Like, stable government is good, but bad stable government is worse than unstable good government. And <laughs> just, I don't know, some thoughts. Maybe this made no sense to you. Maybe after watching this whole video, you're just pro-democracy regardless. You're like, nah, I'm actually, I, I like it in all forms. I think everything should be decided by referendum. I think we should have elections every year or two years or more frequently than we do right now. But I think it's worth mentioning that there is another side to it, and there is uh, a lot of countries that succeed despite interesting de democratic synopsis. Also, it's worth mentioning, you know, China is the world's, it's gonna be the world's superpower despite not being a democracy, and I I don't like that as someone who is pro-freedom, democracy, and all the other things, but I find it interesting, and maybe you should too, or maybe you should, maybe you don't care. Um, <laughs> either way, all I will say is that China, Google Maps, best Google Maps, as you can see, they own this vague swath of sea right here, that's denoted in the vaguest borderline you'll ever see. I kind of want to make a whole video about Chinese Google Maps again, just because it's fun. But for now, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, Qatar is coming up fairly soon. Uh, and I also want to mention, before the end here, while, while you're still here, thank you for watching. I use Wikipedia, if you're curious. I should have said this at the beginning. I use it because I want to use open tools for all these videos. I use Google Maps. I want the tools I use to be easily and instantly available to use. Do you know, do you know how you use Google Maps? Google.com slash maps. You're there, you can use it, and then you click the earth, boom, you get yourself the sphere, you can look at the same stuff I do. If you wanna look at election results, because you think maybe I'm fudging the numbers, look at the elections. Uh, Wikipedia does a really good breakdown, and it's hard to lie about election numbers, right? I want everything to be both easily available and accessible where it can be. That's why I've used what I use for the video. I hope that explains something. I think it's important, and maybe you do too. But anyway, let me know your thoughts on democracy down below. Should we insert more opinions and talk about the politics of other countries? Or should we go back to borders? Because you know what, next video we're doing that regardless. See you all next time. Goodbye. Second channel, don't care.